Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you all to our very special Sephardic uh, Yom HaShoah Holocaust Commemorance. Um, thank you so much for joining us despite the uh, less than easy circumstances. Um, we're going to begin um, now first with a special welcome from Rabbi Nisim El Nikave, the Executive Director of the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America. Rabbi Nisim Behavod. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Uh, dear friends, welcome to, to this very important gathering commemorating Yom HaShoah with so many of you in the Sephardic community. <clears throat> Unfortunately, although we're not able to get together as every year, we all know that it is still very important to remember what transpired during the Second World War. We remember our Sephardic communities who suffered so greatly during the Holocaust. And we may, must never forget them. And at the same time, all those beautiful Jewish communities that suffered so much under the Nazi regime. brings to mind, we must always stay alert and aware, as we know that anti-Semitism has spiked in the last years. Unfortunately, it reminds us what hatred can do. We must never forget, we must educate, we must, we must teach with love and kindness. We must aspire looking towards the world full of harmony that we love to live in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chacham Nisim, Executive Director of the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America. It's now my pleasure to introduce Rabbi Daniel Broskila, who is the International Director of the Sephardic Educational Center, who will say a few words on Sephardic insights to rabbinic in its insights, excuse me, through the Holocaust. Rabbi Buskila the Chavod. Full ceremony for all that are gathered and especially um, for any survivors or family of survivors that are with us. Uh, we hope and pray that this will especially bring all of you a lot of comfort and meaning today. Um, Chacham Ben Sion Meir Hai Uziel was born in Yerushalayim uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, he eventually worked his way to becoming the uh, chief rabbi of Israel, the chief rabbi first of the land of Israel during the British mandate and ultimately of the state of Israel uh, with the birth of Israel in 1948. Uh, but during his rabbinic uh, tenure in Eretz Israel in the land of Israel, he was called to uh, Salonika to become the uh, chief rabbi of their community for a period of about two years from 1920 to 1922. During that period of time, uh, Ham Uziel connected very, very deeply with the people there. He was very much a people's rabbi. He was a great, great Talmud Chacham, a rabbinic scholar, but very much a people's rabbi. And he connected with the Amcha, with the people, with the nation. He wasn't sitting on a throne above, but he was very deeply connected to the community and to the people. When he eventually went back to Eretz Israel, he kept in touch with the community, and I think this community touched his heart and his soul. That is why uh, when the uh, news of the Holocaust, of the Shoah, started making its way over to the Yishuv, to the Jewish settlement in uh, Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, Chacham Uziel, who at the time already was the Rishon Letzion, he was the Sephardic chief rabbi of the whole land of Israel, was the very, very first rabbi, Sephardi or Ashkenazi, to respond and react to the news by gathering several times uh, communities all over Israel, asking them to pray, asking them to fast, uh, had gatherings in synagogues in Jerusalem, in the old city and throughout. There were several signs that were put up like this all over the country, calling on everybody to fast and to mourn and to say certain Psalms. He recited a special prayer that should be added on Rosh Hashanah before the blowing of the shofar because the news was so 
so painful. After the Shoah in 1945, Chacham Uziel was amongst the first to make all of the necessary arrangements in the state of Israel and the budding state of Israel to create what we now call Yom HaShoah. But before it was Yom HaShoah on this date, he had asked that it should be on the 10th of Tevet, Asara Tevet, a fast day that was already on the Jewish calendar. And it's still marked as what's called Yom HaKadish HaKlali, the day to say Kaddish uh, communally for all those who don't have somebody uh, to say Kaddish for them. Why was Chacham Uziel so moved by this? He was, after all, the chief rabbi of the land of Israel. He was not in Europe during the Holocaust. And in additionally, he was also a rabbi who viewed himself as one who wanted to unify Sfaradim and Ashkenazim. And I deeply believe that every word he wrote about the Shoah, every prayer, including a kina, a dirge, very, very similar to those that we read on Tisha B'Av, on the ninth day of Av, mourning the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, he wrote a special kina in memory of the Holocaust uh, victims uh, especially of all of Europe. But I really, really do believe that in his heart, while he was writing and gathering people for prayer and for mourning and for hope, while he had all of the Jewish people in mind, Sfaradim and Ashkenazim, and made no distinction, I think as the news came of what they called Hasrefah Gdola, the grand burning of the Jews, what he first had in his mind and in his vision were the baker and the tailor and the fishermen that he knew in Salonika. These are the people that touched his heart and soul. This was his kehila. This was his community. That is why in 1942, when there was a gathering of rabbis that uh, came together to discuss what was going on in the Holocaust, already then, believe it or not, during the Shoah, there were certain rabbis who will go nameless, but are well recorded, who already started to deliver speeches with the implication that due to the sins in the diaspora, due to the sins of individuals who were sinning and were not observant, God was uh, unleashing his wrath on his people. Rabbi Uziel stood in 1942 in this gathering of distinguished rabbis and said, Chas v'chalila, God forbid that we should ever assign sinning to any single individual who is a korban of the Shoah, who is a Holocaust victim. And why did he say that? Because again, when he thought of the people that he knew in Salonika, those who sat in the rows of the synagogues where he prayed, those whose uh, tailor shop he went to, those who he met uh, at the port, the fishermen, the people who were part of the community, he could not see in those people as chotim, as sinners. He saw them as anashim tohorim, as pure people, as people of faith, on emuna, of people of derach eretz, of chesed, of loving kindness. And so he said, God forbid we should ever impose such theology and to talk about the fact that those that burnt in the Shoah is due to sins. And so Rabbi Uziel's response is amongst the first in Eretz Israel to respond uh, during and after the Holocaust, he wrote several, several responsa, uh, which uh, in halacha, for the benefit of Holocaust survivors, including uh, discussions about building monuments to Holocaust, uh, to, in memory of the Holocaust, and prayers that he composed. He was one of the most uh, significant first rabbinic responders to the Holocaust, and uh, that will be amongst many of the legacies that he left for us. Uh, and hopefully his words, whether they were words of prayer, words of halacha, or words of comfort, bring a lot of comfort to the memories of those who perished during the Shoah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Bruskila. Now one of our two keynote speakers for this afternoon, we have Solomon Kofinas, who is uh, a very special man, both um, in terms of my personal relationship with him. He's in many ways uh, like a uh, second papu to me. Um, Saul uh, is a proud Romano Jew from Athens. He serves as both the Shamash and financial secretary of Kehila Kedosha Yanana Synagogue and Museum in New York. He's an active docent in the museum 
and provides weekly tours to visitors and school groups about the history of the Jews of Greece. A survivor of the Holocaust from Athens, Saul Kofinas immigrated to the United States in 1956 and has lived on the Lower East Side ever since, raising his two children, Chaim and Rachel, with his loving wife, Kula. A proud grandfather and now great-grandfather, Saul is a testament to the Romeo tradition of spirit and more love and community. Saul the Chavod. All right. I'm Saul Kofinas. I come from Greece. I immigrated to United States in 1955, like any other immigrant, to have a better life after the Holocaust. Uh, my family was uh, consist of uh, six people. It was my father, my mother, my older sister, my brother, me, and another brother, baby. During the war, my father tried to, to do the best to make a living for us. And uh, what happened one Saturday that he used to take my sister every Friday to go to Athens to the market to buy groceries and bring it back to the house so my mother cooked for Shabbat. That particular Friday, my sister never come back. They used to go to the synagogue and they used to tell him that we still live in Athens. He was registered. And uh, for that reason, for that uh, Friday that they went over there, they don't let the Jews go home. They kept them there. And then they took him with a truck and they took him someplace, I don't know where. But uh, a young man jumped over the, the fence of the synagogue and he came around to all the Jewish houses. He knew where we live in Petralona and he told us that the Germans that collect the Jews, you better leave your house, go away. So my mother did not know what to do. She figured out maybe they're going to let my father go out the next day. So went around the house who used to, my father used to do business with a tailor that he used to fix suits, selling them to the people that they owned the stores. So my mother told him that uh, something happened to my father, my husband, he didn't come back. They used to go to the synagogue and they're supposed to come back later on. But it seems to me they didn't come back. Can we stay in your place for a couple of days? until we see what's going on. So the tailor says, you come in when I close the place, bring your mattress and you can sleep in my place. And then in the morning, you go back to the house. He used to be around the corner from our house. So we went over there, we sleep a couple of nights. And one particular day, we was going over there to the, to the tailor and my mother needs some diapers for the baby. We have a baby eight months old, Chadiko. She says, I'm gonna tell my brother, keep the baby, I'll go home and get some diapers and I come back. The time she went to get the diapers for, the, for our house, the Gestapo come in and grab my mother. My mother got scared, she started hollowing. She went under the bed. The Germans, they got her out. It was a lot of commotion in the street. And the people came out to see what's happening. And she used to say, I want the baby, I want the baby. So a young man from the neighborhood, they knew where we stay. He came over and told my brother, your mother is asking for the baby. He says, she asking for the baby, okay. He says, take the baby to my mother. He gave him the baby to bring it to my mother. And he grabbed me and we ran away from the place. We went over, is a train go by and they have overpass. We went over the overpass the train on the other side of the neighborhood until the Germans they figured out we are nearby who was gone. So went to the house that we knew 
the Greek people who went over to Kirmanoli's house, we asked his wife if we can stay there because the Germans, they came over, grabbed my mother and with a baby and we don't know what's happening. The man came in and he says, you can stay a couple of nights in my house, but you're gonna have to go away. Otherwise the neighbor's gonna have, gonna have ask questions. Who are you? And we can't, we can't tell them anything. So from, we stay a couple of nights there and they sent us to, our, to their brother in another part of the city of Athens. We went over there, stay one night, and he sent us in another place, another relative, until we end up outside of Athens, the city of Polargo. Over there, we we'll find out it was my mother's sister with a husband and two daughters and a son. So my, my brother says, you can keep my brother here during the day and I come and pick her up in the nighttime because during the day, my brother used to go down in Athens and he used to sell cigarettes. He used to get a pack of a hundred cigarettes. He was selling to the people to make some money. So this way he can buy some food and bring over so we can have some food to eat. Uh, one young man find out that my aunt, they are Jewish, and he went over, he blackmailed them. So he blackmailed them. He told them, you give me money, otherwise I'll go to the police and tell them that you're Jewish. So the people, they said, okay, we're gonna give you some money. So a rumor came over in the neighborhood that somebody blackmailed a Jewish family and they wanna go to the police to tell them that they are Jews. So my brother, when he hears that, he came over, he grabbed me, and we went away. And we got a place, we have a place, a lady has a big yard. And we tell her that the Germans, they got our parents, and she has in the yard a little hut that they used to store the wood during winter time. She says, you, I can give you that place to stay, but uh, I'm not gonna let you come in the house, but you stay over there. And when the neighbors, they ask you, you're gonna tell them that you are my nephews, that the Germans burned the village in the North country, and you came down to live with us. I think their sons, he has four sons. I think their sons was in the resistance because every night when they have a curfew, nobody can go out. These guys, they were going out and they used to tell us, don't tell the neighbors that we're going out. And uh, every time they used to go out and they bring boxes with food, different stuff. They, they used to be a highway. The German stroke they were going by and they used to grab they're going up on the trucks and whatever was loose, they will throw it in the street and then they will bring it in the house and see what they got. Sometimes they used to get food, sometimes they used to get different stuff. So we stay over there until the liberation. And uh, that's, how, that's my story. Thank you so much, Saul. We know it's not always easy to talk about these things, but we do really appreciate it. Um, and for all you do for the community, thank you so much. Okay. Now we're gonna have a very special guest as well. Um, speak um, a dear friend of ours, Dr. Devin Inar, um, who's the Isaac al Hadif Professor of Sephardic Studies um, and Associate Professor of History and faculty at the Strom Center for Jewish Studies at the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. Born and raised in New Jersey, Dr. Nara graduated summa cum laude from Washington University in St. Louis and received his PhD in history at Stanford University. He also served as a Fulbright Fellow to Greece 
and his recent and first book, Jewish Salonika, Between the Ottoman Empire and Modern Greece, was published by Stanford University Press in 2016. Dr. Nara, such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ethan. And uh, thank you very much to all of the organizers, the Hermandad Sefaradith de America and all of the other organizations. I must say that it's, uh, it's very nice to see the, uh, the Hermandad take a, a role that uh, harkens back to its, uh, its role many, uh, many generations, many years ago as a convener of uh, Sephardic cultural, educational and religious activities for Sephardic Jews across the country. No um, and I'm very grateful to be here with the other participants and the esteemed guests and to see so many familiar faces as I scroll through here and familiar names and also many, many of you who I, who I haven't had the privilege of meeting or interacting with yet. So it's very nice to be here um, all, all together, at least remotely. Um, I wanted to begin with, you know, an observation about when we think about the Holocaust in the United States and even more broadly. And when we think about the geography of the Holocaust and the cultural imprint of the Holocaust, normally we're thinking about Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Western Europe. We're thinking about Europe, certainly. We're thinking about Yiddish culture. We're thinking about Warsaw. We're thinking about Anne Frank. And these are the kinds of touch points and guides that often take us through our understanding of the Holocaust and Holocaust commemoration. Um, we don't think about often, unless we have a particular reason, such as those of us gathered here today, to be extra aware of the vast reach of the Nazis final solution, the vast devastation, brutality and violence that was meted out upon the Jewish communities of the Mediterranean world along the shores of the Aegean Sea into the heart of the Balkan Peninsula. That ignorance, and I think it's fair to call it an ignorance, it's an absence, a blindness, was brought home to me in a very powerful way when I was a college student over 15 years ago and I was part of the Holocaust commemoration activities in, in the community where I was at the time. And I was invited to participate in a community-wide Yom HaShoah commemoration. And before the program began, um, I was meeting with some of the other participants and an older woman and I began to speak and she inquired, uh, what was my relationship to the Holocaust? Why was I there? And I explained that my great uncle, his wife and their two children all perished in Auschwitz. And she asked me, and I'll never forget, and she asked me, where were they from? And I said, Salonika, Greece. And she looked at me with a, a look of confusion and she paused and then she spoke and she said, that can't be, that can't be. I was a prisoner in Auschwitz and I never met a Jew from Greece. And that moment really struck me and it has not left me in all of those years because I interpreted at that time as a unintentional, I suppose, but nonetheless an effective form of Holocaust denial, a kind of denial out of ignorance, out of not knowing, out of a lack of imagination that made it ne nearly impossible for such a person, and she is not alone. I've had many encounters like this along the way in the last uh, decade and a half. Um, where it becomes impossible not only to imagine that there could be Jews in Greece or Turkey or these other geographies that are at the core of the Sephardic Jewish experience, but that these communities could have been so impacted and devastated by the Holocaust. That kind of encounter redoubled my efforts. It, it rededicated me to the work of trying to recuperate, recover, and promote the history and culture of the Sephardic Jewish communities, not only to have our suffering, um, to have the destruction of our communities recognized, but also to recuperate the rich world and lives of our forefathers and our ancestors for generations, along the lines of the great minds that Rabbi Buskil referred to in terms of Rabbi Uziel, Uziel and, and many others. And I think bringing the story of the Sephardic Jews to light and the persecution suffered during the Holocaust 
is significant for these reasons. And it's why today's program is so significant. But it's not only significant because it provides us with an opportunity to have our stories as Sephardim and as the heirs, as survivors and as the descendants and heirs of Sephardic victims of the Holocaust, to have our stories recognized. But it's also to understand the Holocaust from a more dynamic and holistic and a broader approach, right? It is not just about the destruction of the Jewish communities of Eastern and Central and Western Europe. While it is about the decimation of the heartland of the Ladino speaking communities in Salonika and Rhodes and Sarajevo and Monastir and elsewhere and the Greek speaking communities of Yanina, it also helps us understand that we're talking about a vast geographic scope here. We're talking about tens of thousands of people who were born in the Ottoman Empire that were caught up in the final solution. The fact that Nazi officials went all the way to the island of Rhodes, which is just off the coast of Turkey. You can see Turkey from the island of Rhodes. They went all the way there to round up just 1,600 Jews, brought them by ship across the Aegean Sea to Athens, and from there deported them through the trains in the Balkans all the way to Central Europe, where they were murdered at Auschwitz, a voyage of multi-modes by ship and train, 23 days in May of 1944, as the Nazis are losing the war. And the Nazis knew it, that the end goal from the Nazis' perspective was not just to win the war. If it was to win the war, why would they be expending so much energy and effort to deal with a tiny little community on the periphery of their world? just off the coast of Turkey, but it demonstrated the centrality, the importance of the final solution, the desire and the tenacity with which the Nazi leadership sought to fulfill its des desire to, um, to bring about the final solution. How else can we explain that? And if we don't understand, we don't understand the way in which the Sephardic communities of the Mediterranean were impacted and were devastated by the Holocaust. We cannot understand what the Holocaust was about, the vastness of it, the reach of it, the devastation of it. So on today's Yom HaShoah, I hope we take away a desire not only to recognize and acknowledge the Sephardic communities, our Sephardic communities, the destruction of the Judeo-Spanish heartland, but also to recognize that the, our understanding of the Holocaust, its reach, its aims, its goals, and its impact is not complete unless we understand the experience of the Sephardic Jews. I'd like to leave you with a, it's actually a song, I'm not going to sing it to you, but a poem in Ladino by a survivor from Salonika, a gentleman by the name of uh, David Chaim, and uh, I'm going to read it to you in Ladino, in Judeo-Spanish, and then I'm going to give it to you in English. And I want you to think about what this gentleman's motivation for survival is. It's called Siete Dias Encerrados. Siete Dias Encerrados en Vagones de Behemaz. Una vez a los tres días nos quitaban a rear. Madre mía, mi querida, ya tu vites el zehut de muerirte en tus tierras y no pasates por el oluc. Padre mío, mi querido, ¿quién te lo iba a decir? Que vinieras con tu hermano al crematorio de Auschwitz. Padre y madre, hermanos y hermanicas, saliendo todos rejagis. El patrón del mundo, que me envíe salud a mí, que me quite de estos campos para vos Echar Kadish. Seven days locked up in boxcars for animals. Once every three days, they took us out to get some air. My mother, my beloved mother, you had the good fortune of dying in your own land and not passing through the chimney. My dear and beloved father, who would have ever told you that you would go with your brother 
to the crematorium of Auschwitz. Father and mother, brother and little sisters, all of you have been supplicants to the Lord of the world. May he bring me health and may he liberate me from these camps so that I may recite Kaddish. And I think, uh, for me, what's very powerful is that, what is the motivation for survival? It is not so he can go back home. It is not so he can see his family and his relatives, although I'm sure that's also his motivation. It is not so he can have his house back and see his stuff and walk the streets. His motivation is to say the Kaddish for his family, to properly mourn them and acknowledge them. And I hope that we can also continue in fulfilling that desire today as we say Ashkava in memory of those of our communities and all those who departed during the Shoah. Thank you. Merci mucho, Dr. Nar. Thank you so much for joining us and for beautiful rendition both of the Ladino poem and um, of the reflections on how we view the Sephardic Holocaust. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure now to welcome uh, Renan Cohen, uh, a world-renowned pianist, composer, soprano, and musical therapist. Renan, I'm sorry. Just... Renan was born and raised in the Sephardic Jewish community of Istanbul. One of Renan's most recent albums, Holocaust Remembrance Before Sleep, released in 2015, on the same day of the installation of the Therendestant concentration camp. This project documents the research conducted by Renan into the life stories, ideals, and works of composers who continued to create, notwithstanding the prohibitions imposed on them while being imprisoned in the concentration camp. In addition to her musical career, Renan also serves as a Jewish community counselor for the Jewish community of Turkey. She is also a descendant of the Jews from the community of Kastoria. Renan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ethan. It's so meaningful to be here for me. Hello, everyone. Uh, dear eminent ra uh, rabbis, uh, dear Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of, of America and all the participants. Um, I would like to start with a Romanian partisan song tonight. Uh, actually, our chief rabbi of Turkey gave it to me as a present last year, this manuscript. He was in Romania in 1995 for a commemoration of Holocaust. He said to me, I was with Eli Wiesel. And this song, uh, it's performed in the concert and he was so, uh, so pleased to hear that song and asked what it is. And they gave him uh, this manuscript uh, and he gave it to me as a present. And on this manuscript, I don't know why, it's written in Arabic. And it says principle of judgment. And also in other part of the manuscript, it says hug me. It's very makam music. Um, so I hope you will enjoy the music now. Thank you. 
And now I would like to continue with the Rhodos Sephardic songs, Sephardic song from Rhodos. As a, a descendants of the Castorian family that we lost a part of our family. They deported from Castoria uh, to Auschwitz and they died there. And it always breaks my heart a lot when I hear uh, until the last person in the islands, the Nazis deported to Auschwitz. It really breaks my heart. That's why I choose this Sephardi song from Rodos and I will continue uh, with Eli Eli song. So the Sephardic song says, Como la rosa en la guerra, y las flores sin abrir, ansi es un, una donzella, a las horas del morir. Like the rose in the garden, and the unopened flowers, so is a maiden, at the hours of death. And Eli Eli, written as a poem by a Jewish resistance fighter, Hannah Zenz, in 1942. And the Israeli composer, David Zehavi, composed it in 1945. And it says, my God, may it never end. The sand and the sea, the rustle of the water, the brilliance of the sky, and the prayer of man.
And as a last piece, I would like to continue with Adio Querida that, as we all know, the Greek Jews in Auschwitz, they were singing to each other when they were going to death. So it means goodbye, beloved, goodbye. All the victims we lost in Holocaust may be rest in peace. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Renan, for that beautiful rendition um, of the sweet, beautiful songs. And thank you so much for your participation all the way from Istanbul. We really greatly appreciate it. So now, um, although we're physically apart, and I know it's a bit difficult nowadays, we're going to try to do something very special that often happens at uh, 
Holocaust Yom HaShoah commemorations, we're going to try um, lighting candles. And what is going to happen now, we've asked a number of community members to light candles on behalf of their relatives and different communities, Sephardic communities in particular, that were lost in the Shoah. Um, first, we will have our dear friend, Sarah Arawesti, light a candle on behalf of the Jewish community of Monastir. Sarah, please. Thank you, Sarah. Now we're going to ask our friend Melanie Russo to light a candle on behalf of the Jewish community of Castoria. Mel is also the granddaughter of Lena Russo, a survivor from Castoria. Thank you, Mel. Now we're going to ask Marvin Marcus to light a candle on behalf of the Jewish community of Veria. Marvin is the president of Kehila Kedosha Yanana Synagogue and Museum in New York, and also the son of Louis Marcus, who immigrated from Veria at the turn of the century. Thank you, Marvin. We'll now ask Alana Hassan to light a candle on behalf of the Jews of Rhodes and Coast. Alana is a member of Congregation Ezra Besaroth in Seattle, and she's also the granddaughter of Joseph Hassan, uh, blessed memory, a survivor of Rhodes. Thank you, Alana. We'll now ask Kula Kofinas to light a candle on behalf of the Jewish community of Larisa. Kula is a member of Kehila Kedoshiyanana and also a survivor from the Jewish community of Larisa. Thank you so much, Kula. We'll now ask Adam Kofinas to light a candle with his daughter, Stella Kofinas, on behalf of the Jewish community of Yanana. Adam is the grandson of Saul and Kula Kofinas, and his daughter, Stella, is their first great granddaughter. Thank you, Adam. We'll now ask Sam Nachmias, the Vice President of the Jewish Youth Club of Athens, to light a candle on behalf and memory of the Jews of Athens. Thank you, Sam. When I ask Igor Benzion Kozmenjakin, the Hazan from the Jewish community of Sarajevo, to light a candle on behalf of the Jews of Sarajevo. Thank you, Benzion. When I ask David Baruch, a survivor from the Jewish community of Patras, to light a candle on behalf and memory of the Jews of Patras. David. Thank you, David. Well, I'll ask Andrew Marcus to light a candle on behalf of the Jewish community of Hanya Crete. Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Well, I'll ask last and certainly not least, Rebecca and Eli Almo to light a candle on behalf of the Jewish community of Salonika. Eli's parents of blessed memory were survivors from Salonika. Thank you, Eli and Rebecca.
we'll now continue, before we continue, excuse me, I'll ask that if anyone would like to light a candle now on behalf of any of the communities, on behalf of a loved one, memory of anyone affected by the Holocaust, they can do so now. Thank you all. Now, as we continue forward, I'd like to ask a few of our rabbis, our community rabbis, to give us an introduction first to the Askava Memorial Prayer, followed by a recitation of the Askava first in Hebrew, then in Ladino, then in Le Greek, and finally in English. We will begin first with a brief introduction by Rabbi Daniel Hadar, the spiritual leader of Temple Moses in Miami. Rabbi Hadar, the Havon. Ethan and everybody, <clears throat> very briefly, the Ashkava prayer is really a prayer for the soul of a person who passed away. We typically do this in the Bet Knesset or in, as we say, Kal, after somebody has an Aliyah in remembrance of somebody who, who has passed away. Certainly we do it at the cemetery and we also do it whenever there is a Meldado, which is a time of remembrance and a time of learning for that person on their passing, on the day of their passing. And we have a special Ashkava prayer for men and also for women. The key of both prayers really is recognizing uh, what's most important to us in our lives. In the men's prayer, for example, it'll say, Tov Shem, Mishem, and Tov. It's better to have a good name. It's a play off the, the root word of Shem and Shemin. It's better to have a good name than to have good oil, as it were. That at the end of our lives, we know what's most important is how what we take with us is what really what we give in this life. Similarly, in this prayer of the Ashkava for the women, which begins with Eshet Chayel, woman of valor, we also see in there, Sheker Achen Vehevel Yofi, which means that all those things that surround our physical appearances and those of elements of physicality are not that important. What's truly important is what's inside and what we give over. So we're gonna say the Ashkavot now, we'll say for men, and also for women, we have in mind those who have passed away as a prayer for their soul, but also in recognizing all that they have done and all they've given in this world. And this prayer should be a big zahut for them. Amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi Adar. We'll now begin uh, with the Hebrew with Rabbi Simon Ben Zaken, the spiritual leader at Congregation Ezra Beseret, the Chavot. Tov shem mi shemen tov. Ashri shiaret Adonai ve mitzvotav chafetz meod. Eshet chayil mi imtza verachok mi penini mikhra. Menucha nechona tachat kamfea shechina. Kezu ararakia mazirim. El male rachamim u itmale verachamav hamerubim. Al nefashot. Ruchot un shamot be malot kedoshimutorim ve giborim kezoara rakia mazirim lenishmot achen wa kedoshim at sefaradim ve aromaniot chenaflu chelek mi sheshet millionea yeudim halelea shoa be milchemet olama shenia be Europa. Shenergu, Shenish Hatu, Shenit Refu, Veshenish Fual Kidush Hashem, Videa Meratsehimar, Germanim, Mandachim, Veodrehem, Mishar Amim, Mimashemam, Lachen Balarachamim, Veatselichot, Astirem Betzeter Kenafecha, Leolamim. Ucel Shadai Tlonanu, Ulketsa Yamim Tamidem, Uminaha Ladane Hatashkem, Utsror Bitror Haim et Nishmotehem, Vetasim Kavod Menuhatam, Utlave Alem Ashalom, Utkayem Baemikrase Katu, Venaha Adunai Tamid, Veitzbia Vetatehod Namsheha Vat Motehaya Halit. Veaita ke gan rabeuch mozamai ma shelo echa zebu memav. Adonai hu nachalatam. Begane dente menuchatam. 
יעמדו לגורלם לקץ הימים ונאמר אמן. Thank you to Rabbi Ben Zaken. We'll now ask Rabbi Gabriel Negrin, the Rabbi of Athens, to read the Askava prayer in Greek. As we're having some technical difficulties, we'll move on to Rabbi Misimon Nekave, the Executive Director of the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, uh, to read the Askava in Ladino. Rabbi Misim Dechavo. Thank you, Ethan. I'd just like to mention that we're here at a very holy place, the synagogue in Forest Hills. Our dear Rabbi Asher Murciano, this is the translation that he provided uh, for the community, and it was given to us by our dear friend, Dr. Joe Halio, who's always very eager, always looking out for the Sephardic community. Más que hacerte fino, y día de su muerte más que día de su nacer. Rahamaná, Dios lleno de piedades, tú que moras en las alturas, rogamos a ti a que des tranquilidad y reposo al pie del trono divino, en la morada de los bienaventurados, donde brilla sin quedar un esplendor sin igual a las almas de aquellos bravos y héroes, miembros del pueblo de Israel, que afirmaron todo lo que encomendates en tu santa ley con toda sinceridad y con su sabiduría y sus acciones. Arrelumbraron y inspiraron a los descendientes de Jacob, membra para bien a los que se privaron de todos los gustos y placeres de la vida dedicados a enseñar a sus hijos tu santa ley, y fueron quemados sobre los quemaderos. Acuérdate los que con entusiasmo alabaron tu nombre y cantaron nuestras oraciones, y fueron arrastrados por el enemigo con desdenio y menosprecio. Sea su memoria bendicha. Los ángeles de la paz lloran amargamente por los padres, madres, Jóvenos y jóvenes, chicos y mamantes, los que fueron arrancados y esparcidos los unos de los otros, y por fin entregaron sus almas por la santidad de tu nombre. Y después de ser quemados, la ceniza de sus cadáveres de vino polvo de la tierra llena, dales lo que se les merece a aquellos héroes, que pelearon y entregaron sus almas con el Shema Israel en sus labios. Bendice a aquellos que pelearon cuerpo y alma por establecer una morada de siempre para Israel y hacer tornar tu pueblo a la tierra prometida. Tú que sos rey de los reyes, rogamos a ti a que des reposo a todos aquellos de nuestros padres, hermanos y hijos que hicieron el sacrificio supremo y pelearon y murieron en campos de batalla por traer a la paz en el mundo, a ti creador del universo. Te rogamos que en paz descansen tus escogidos y seas con ellos misericordioso. Amén. Amén. Thank you, Rabbi. Now we'll ask Rabbi Gabriel Negrin from Athens to read the Ashkava. In, in Greek, Rabbi Negrin, the Chavod. Polies lasne kirie, se tis kalosinis, polie le despotaturanu ketis gis, 
Σι ο αιώνιος ο δότης δικαστής ο αληθινός, Σι ο δίκαιος όσιος κρίτης ο επίκης, Σι που με δικαιοσύνη διδείς τη ζωή και με δικαιοσύνη την αφαιρείς. Ανάπαυσε παρακαλούμε σε τις ψυχές των αδικοχαμένων, άσπυλων αδελφών μας, χιλιάδων αθών θυμάτων και ηρών του ολοκαυτώματος, πολύτιμων τέκνων των ιερών Ισραηλιτικών κοινοτήτων, που ήταν αναπόσπαστο κομμάτι των εκατομμυρίων Άγιων και αγωνών αδελφών μας, που φρικτά δολοφονήθηκαν μαζικά και βάναυσα, σκληρά σφαγιάστηκαν, απάνθρωπα αποτεχθρώθηκαν και άφησαν την τελευταία τους πνοή, αγιάζοντας το πάνσεπ το όνομά σου, Συ που όλα τα γνωρίζεις και όλα τα συγχωρείς, χορήγησέ τους βαθιά ανάπαυση. Ήψιστε παντοκράτορα, αιώνιε βασιλιά, άρχοντα της κάθε πνοής των ενσαρκωμένων ζωντανών, ποιμένα των ψυχών των ανθρώπων, Σι είσαι να σταθείς, ακλόνητος φρουρός της μνήμης τους, για χάρη του πανιερού ονόματός σου, άνοιξε τις πύλες των ουρανών και μετά τιμών και δόξας δέξου τις ψυχές αυτές, καθώς ήσαν ενώπιόν σου τα δικαιώματα των ευσεβών. Με αγάπη πότισέτες από τον εκλεκτό σου ποταμό, και ευλογησέτες με την ελεήμονα δεξιά σου για πλήρη ανάπαυση, την οποία επιφυλάσσεις για τους δικαίους λάτρης της αστήρευτης μεγαλοδυναμίας της μοναδικότητάς σου και κατάταξε τις ψυχές των αδικοχαμένων σου στο υποπόδιο του θεϊκού σου θρόνου, την πηγή και την καταγωγή όλων των ψυχών για να αναπαύονται όνια Υπό του πάμω πάνω να μου ποτώσω προστατευμένε και μακάριε. Γαλήνια σε επικρατεί στον τάφο του και α του συντροφεύει παντοτινά ειρήνη. Και αυτό α είναι το θέλημά σου. Και είπατε αμέν. Αμέν. Thank you, Rabbi, so much. And at last, particularly not least, we ask Rabbi Ben Hassan from Sephardic Pikofalim in Seattle to recite the Askava in English, Rabbi Bechavod. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the Sephardic Brotherhood for putting this meaningful program together for all of us to uh, partake. Merciful Father who lives in heaven, we pray that you grant tranquil rest at the foot of the divine throne where the happiest dwell, where there exists an equal brilliant splendor to the souls of the brave heroes of the Jewish people who affirmed all that you commanded in your holy Torah. With sincerity, wisdom, and actions, they enlightened and inspired the descendants of Jacob. Remember for good those deprived of the enjoyments and pleasures of life, those dedicated to teaching their children your holy Torah, those that burned in the ovens of the camps. Remember those who with enthusiasm prayed, praised your name and sang our prayers as they were tortured by the enemy with hatred and disdain, blessed be their memory. We cry bitterly for the fathers and mothers, young boys and girls, infants and babies, separated from one another in anguish, finally giving over their souls for your holy name. O King of Kings, we pray to you that you grant peace to all our Jewish brethren and that their memory shall never be forgotten. Creator of the universe, we pray that you grant compassion bring peace to the world, and let us say, Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Asad. With that, we are concluding our Sephardic Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance in memory of the Romaniot and Sephardic Jews of Greece, the Balkans, and throughout Europe. 
I want to take the opportunity first on behalf of the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, La Hermandad Sephardi de America, to thank our, our co-sponsors, namely Kehila Kedoshi Yanana, the Sephardic Educational Center, Sephardic Biko Holim, Temple Moses, Sephardic Federation of Latin America, Fasela, Congregation Ezra Bestaroth, Sephardic Heritage International DC, Congregation Or Shalom, the Sephardic Temple of Cedarhurst, Congregation Avalat Achim in Portland, the Greek Jewish and Sephardic Young Professionals Network, Sephardic Young Professionals Network of Seattle, the Seattle Sephardic Network, and Sephardic Adventure Camp. Special thank you to all our program participants coming from near and far, whether you be in New York, in Miami, in Atlanta, in the Midwest, in California, in Seattle, in Portland, even as far as Sarajevo, Athens, Turkey, or beyond. We want to thank you so much for participating. Uh, special thank you to the invaluable aid of Museum Director Marsha Haddad Ikomoropoulos from Kihila Kedoshianana and Dee Simon, the Barrow Family Executive Director at the Holocaust Center for Humanity for their consultation in organizing this Holocaust commemoration. I want to close with one personal note. I hope in a difficult time like this where we can't physically be together to honor the memory of those we've lost, that we're able to come together in this digital way with over 200 participants between Facebook and Zoom, I think is a testament to how amazing our communities can be even in times of crisis. That even when we can't be physically together, we won't forsake our duties to honor those who we lost. Now, I hope um, this also takes an opportunity for everyone to get more involved in their local communities and realize that we're more than just one community whether it be New York, Miami, Atlanta, Portland, Seattle, Indianapolis, California, Greece, Turkey, Bosnia or beyond, we're all one Kehila, all one Sephardic community, Roman community together. And I hope that everyone gets a little more active in their communities, whether it be their local communities, their synagogues, or even the Sephardic Brotherhood, we hope you'll get more involved. I wanna thank you all again for joining us and wish you all only a good week going forward one of only health and prosperity and good things. Thank you all.